The problem of anti-Semitism, as we've always known it, is in it's extremely linked to rising xenophobia, anti-immigrant feeling, economic and social crisis, and globalization. Um, the jihadi threat is a threat to every liberal democratic society. They target the state, the police, the military, organizations that practice civilized freedom of expression. So it's wrong, I think, to stress Jewish exceptionalism. And it's, yes, we have to be aware of anti-Semitism, but to single out ourselves out as being something special at this time, I think, is wrong. And race hatred is much worse for others. But the Roma in Europe, they are the most disadvantaged minority. One in three Muslims across Europe say they've experienced discrimination in the last 12 months. And survey data shows that Europeans are largely united in their rejection of Muslims and Islam. And when it comes to the study of monitoring anti-Semitism, there are serious issues to do with data, quality of interpretation, analysis, and some incredibly egregious exaggerations. It's very difficult to compare country to country, for example, because if you're looking at data, every, virtually every country has a different way of compiling it. It's very difficult to make generalizations. People talk about Europe, you know, anti-Semitism in Europe. Well, the anti-Semitism in Poland is very, very different from the anti-Semitism in, in France. Uh, the anti-Semitism in Russia is very different from the anti-Semitism in, in the UK. It comes out in different ways. So how do you make a generalization about Europe? Also, uh, for example, reporting rates of incidents. Um, uh, the, these are affected by so many things. You know, the time when these things happen, the atmosphere in society when such events take place, uh, uh, and even the news, what's happening at the time affects whether people will report incidents uh, or not. There is also, uh, excessive reliance on the numbers of incidents as a measure of anti-Semitism. Surveys may rely on perceptions of Jews, of what Jews think about anti-Semitism. And this introduces a very large element of subjectivity. Um, and indeed, in some places, compiling incidents uh, based purely on whether the person reporting it says it was an incident or not. Now, that obviously raises all kinds of Questions. Even the facts are in dispute. There was a synagogue in France that was said to be attacked by a howling mob. Um, the uh, president of the synagogue said that this was simply not true. Two stories came out. Um, even today, I don't think you know, people can agree on whether it was a howling mob or whether the Jews were safe inside. There's a lot of interpretation and, uh, and, and there's a lot of misinterpretation of data um, that goes on. I won't go into details here. And there's a lot of scaremongering. There's a poll in the Jewish Chronicle, the main newspaper in the United Kingdom, that came out in, in August. Banner headline, 63% of Jews are questioning their future in the UK. Well, it soon emerged that this poll was just a straw poll of 150 Jews on self-identifying Jews who were leaving a shopping center in a, a Jewish area of, of London. And, you know, this reliable data was splashed on the front page of the Chronicle. The um, number of qualified mainstream Jewish social scientists lambasted uh, the Jewish Chronicle newspaper for publishing this effectively junk poll uh, and for responsibly saying fear and panic. But the same thing emerged again, not the same poll, a different poll, by a new organization that was set up in Britain recently called the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, which is a, an organization set up because it didn't like the way the mainstream community was dealing with the question of anti-Semitism. They didn't think that they, that they were linking it enough to attacks on Israel, and they wanted more defending of Israel going on. They produced a poll which reportedly produced the same kind of data, it emerged to be very, very flawed poll. So there are a lot of issues around methodology and interpretation. It makes it very hard to get a full, accurate uh, picture. Um, and it opens up the whole area of anti-Semitism, study and analysis and activism to abuse and manipulation. So which brings us back to the question, 
uh, of Islam. So let's try and just put these two, these two things together. It's about anti-Semitism. Um, by focusing on the challenges. First thing to say is that, you know, once upon a time, and I remember this once upon a time, there was a broad consensus about what anti-Semitism was. We didn't mean that researchers and academics all agreed about it. They disagreed, as people do, about data and about you know, interpreting what's happening. Um, but at least it was balanced discussion uh, and it could take place. At that time, has passed. There is now no uh, common sense among scholars and amongst researchers about what anti-Semitism is. The entire field of anti-Semitism studies has become politicized and, and partisan. Uh, and this expressed itself in proliferation of research institutes and so-called research institutes and so-called think tanks many of which are basically pro-Israel advocacy organizations um, you know, using this issue of anti-Semitism to promote their particular um, agenda. Um, and the main reason for this is effectively Israel. The policy changed by Israel in the 80s and 90s produced this theory of the new anti-Semitism that dominates most writing about anti-Semitism today. Israel is the Jew among the nations. That's the basic tenet of the idea of the new anti-Semitism. It's that the original anti-Semitism was uh, hatred of the individual Jew and the attempt to banish the individual Jew from society. The new anti-Semitism is hatred of the collective Jew, Israel, and the attempt to banish Israel from the family of, uh, of nations. And new anti-Semitism, to me, and I've written about this and argued about this, fundamentally means that to warrant the charge of anti-Semitism, it's sufficient to hold any view ranging from criticism of the policies of the current Israeli government to denial of Israel's right to exist without having to subscribe to any of the elements which historians have traditionally regarded as constituting an anti-Semitic view. This, in my view, completely subverts the definition of anti-Semitism, drains it of, of meaning, um, and it puts out of bounds perfectly legitimate discussion of whether increased anti-Semitism is or is not a result of Israel's actions. The new anti-Semitism theory was able to become more influential because the rises in incidents over witnessed at certain times over the last 15 years can be linked to anti-Israel hostility. But to label all these incidents as anti-Semitic stretches the meaning of the word anti-Semitism to breaking point. More and more you'll find people arguing that a new word is needed uh, or that the differences between Muslim hostility on account of Israel and anti-Semitism as we know it must be uh, spelt out. There is certainly some hatred of Israel that is fueled by anti-Semitic motives. But um, as a friend and uh, colleague of mine, um, Dr. Brian Cluck, who actually taught here in Chicago um, for, for an, uh, a number of years, as he put it, um, on the one hand, there is a form of hostility to Israel that derives from bigotry about Jews. On the other hand, there is a form of bigotry about Jews that derives from hostility to Israel. The two phenomena overlap and interact, but they are different in the way in, they are different in the way they're opposites. Calling the second phenomenon anti-Semitism does not help us to understand either its nature or its problems. Inevitably, this takes us to the question of Israel's responsibility for anti-Jewish hostility and anti-Semitism today. If the former argument about anti-Semitism invites ugly vitriol, this one brings a ton of bricks down onto your head, but the logic is obvious. It's the Jewish anti-Semitism monitoring bodies themselves that make the link between what Israel does and the hostility that occurs. This is what they report, this is what they put in their reports. Surely it's a no-brainer to advance an argument that if Israel didn't do what it was doing, Jews in Europe and elsewhere wouldn't experience this additional. 
that make that argument in any mainstream Jewish setting and uh, virtually get lynched. So, to conclude, the challenges. The nexus between Israel and anti-Semitism is the defining feature of virtually all public attention and debate about anti-Semitism. And it's powerfully intensified and exploited by the current Israeli government and many other pro-Israel advocacy groups and right-wing think tanks, I already mentioned. It's virtually impossible to entangle these two things as well, anti-Semitism, but try we must, because if we don't, we damage efforts to combat the real anti-Semitism that exists, to combat that effectively. Um, and we need policies that determine the, three, the real threats and target them accordingly. And this mixing of the two things makes that very difficult. And what it will do, it will allow right-wing Jewish leadership, commentators, politicians to pursue their anti-Muslim agenda, their message that Jews in Israel are in the front line against Islam, and therefore fuel Jewish Muslim community tensions. And we'll be giving Israel a free pass to exploit Jewish fears and the real anti-Semitism that exists in order to shore up its own political position, uh, its international image, and its policies. And there's bound to be further impact on the normalization of diaspora Jewish life and the revival of diasporic autonomy in recent years, which is a very important feature of what's been happening to Jewish communities in Europe. As the veteran uh, peace campaigner Maria Berry recently wrote, and I quote, when Benjamin Netanyahu does not miss an opportunity to, to declare that he represents all the Jews in the world, he makes all the world's Jews responsible for Israeli policies and action. End quote. Indeed, that is utterly reprehensible on Bibi's part, but Jews seem to want it both ways. Many Jews seem to want it both ways. To have their positive connections to Israel approved by the societies in which they live, yet wash their hands of any responsibility for what Israel does. Can we meet the challenges? It's difficult. We have to insist on delineating the difference between Muslim hostility arising out of anger over Israel-Palestine and anti-Semitism as hatred of the mythical Jew. The two phenomena need to be dealt with differently. We need to continue to expose the fallacies of the new anti-Semitism theory. We need to build alliances with other minorities, including Muslims, of course, uh, on ways to combat the severe discrimination and har harassment they experience. And this goes together with making it clear publicly that we understand that hostility to Jews exists within a wider context, growing racism and xenophobia and so on. We mustn't exceptionalize the Jewish experience as if it is always and fair for worse than anything anyone else experiences. And we have to be open about Israel's responsibility for the current situation challenge the view that it will always act in the interests of the Jews worldwide. And if I may just uh, quote my uh, colleague and friend Ryan Clark again, he wrote recently, the situation now of Jews in much of the world is dominated not by an anti-Jewish state, but by a Jewish state. Not by policies and actions that are directed against Jewish interests, but in the name of those interests and not by a hostile power, Germany, that occupies the lands where Jews live, but by a friendly power, Israel, that occupies territory where others live. So, my friends, finally, I think we have to redouble our own efforts to help Palestinians and Israelis reach a just peace based on equal rights for all. That will do this problem a power of good. Thank you. Yeah.